Lorraine Schlag, and I am the Textile Collection Manager at the Cohasset Historical Society. And I'd like to welcome you to the uh, exhibition we have up right now, Verbalos, Flounces, and Fripperies, The Gilded Age in Cohasset. And I'm going to start with a brief history of the tour. Um, the Gilded Age is the time period from 1865 to 1900. In an undocumented 1871 declaration on the latest fashionable ideals, it states, a fashionable costume is a delicious melange of puffings, cross-cut tuckings, ruchings, ruffles, bows and flutings, kilt platings, side platings, fringes, laces, flounces, furbelows, and fripperies. In this Gilded Age exhibit, you will actually see just about every one of these details. In 1873, Mark Twain coined the term the Gilded Age to describe the divided time in this country's history. While the Beaux-Arts style in France was grand, in America it was on steroids. And by 1900, society became more stratified than ever before or ever since. The Beaux-Arts style, characterized by classical forms, massive proportions, and lavish, usually symmetrical detailing in architecture was carried over into fashion. French couturiers such as Worth, Balmain, Pignon, and Corbet Wenzel were visited by millionaires' wives and daughters, each wanting to outdo each other as money poured into the houses of the New York financiers and industrialists. Clothing became grander and more opulent and was embellished with lavish trims a reflection of the time's prosperity, as well as the technological advances in the textile production industry, which led to an influx of silk, tulle, tassels, braids, elaborate beadings, and fripperies, a glittering facade that masked greed and corruption. These were the hallmarks of the Gilded Age. Industrialization, politics, and urbanization were the themes of the time period when explosive economic and industrial growth was accompanied by great political corruption. Starting post-Civil War and into the 1900s, massive fortune, fortunes were made and lost, and old money fought against flashy newcomers for a spot atop the so social heap in America. The titans of banking, railroading, meatpacking, oil refining and mining were anxious to flaunt their fortunes and better their social standing as they amassed arts and antiquities from Europe. At the same time, the expansion of cities caused by the influx of mass immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe resulted in overcrowding and dramatically altered the population's ethnic and religious composition. Families like the Astors, the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, Morgans, Fricks, and Rockefellers amassed outrageous fortunes as robber barons and industrialists, while millions of immigrants arrived at Ellis Island in search of a better future. So what led to the end of the Gilded Age? Many factors changed the mood, including a stock market plunge of 1893, the antitrust policies of Theodore Roosevelt, the introduction of the income tax in 1913, and World War I, all resulting in the sudden obsolescence of the elite who basically had previously ruled the country. If you've seen any episodes of the HBO series The Gilded Age, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say, clothes were not simply a matter of covering the body decently and reasonably well. They were a lethal weapon and walking advertisement of status of a husband's or father's wealth and success. Let me take you into the exhibit hall and we'll talk about each one of the garments on display. Let's begin the tour with these three dresses behind the stanchions. The first dress, the cream colored dress in the, in the middle, with the red trim is an evening gown from 1865. It is worn by Maria Barnes. The gown was purchased during a grand tour of Europe in 1865 by the Barnes family. They paid $100 for it. In today's money, that would be $1,828.28, but we believe it's worth way more than that. 
The Peter Sham and the Barnes family passport are our, um, as well as family correspondence, back up the details of this dress. The 1860s introduced the era of the skirt and bodice in place of a one-piece dress, and the bodice also became slightly shorter during this time period. The bodice and skirt are made of cream and red silk taffeta with red silk bows that have half waxed pearls inside. Pearls also trim the dress throughout. The neckline is a Bertha neckline and the sleeves have silk net inserts. There is a narrow black and cream lace trim along the front and the back tails. The bottom of the skirt has a wide fur below and is backed with starched buckram. The tails are backed with heavy netting. All the fringe trim is silk. This dress is worn with a symmetrical hoop and a small pad to enhance the bouffants in the back. The dress would have been worn with a balleuse petticoat or a sweeper petticoat. And that indicates that the petticoat had multiple ruffles underneath in order to, to catch the street soils and protect the silk from, um, from soils and, and dirt. The cream colored dress is from 1894. It is a wedding dress worn by Maud Dickinson Snow, who married Ephraim Snow. The maker here was Thaxter Designs in Boston. The bodice is made of silk satin with a Bertha neckline, embellished with pleated silk chiffon and elaborate pearl beading. The bodice has side closures, giving it the, a smooth look all around under the rib cage. The sleeves have a pleated gathered cap and are edged with a double row of pleated chiffon and large knotted bows. The matching skirt has center back pleating and a long train with a corded edge and a double row of fur belows. All right, the third dress in this group is from 1898. It is an evening gown, the black and cream, worn by Laura Stoughton Bell, and it's from 1898. This is a Worth-inspired gown. It is not a Charles Frederick Worth gown, although it looks just like one. It is uh, constructed of cream and gold silk satin brocade, and it has um, black and cream lace at the front and the back and around the bodice. It is elaborately boned and it has lacing closures in the back underneath hook and eyes. Uh, the matching skirt is of patterned silk brocade and it has a silk taffeta lining and no fur belows on this dress. At this time, I'd like to introduce Kathy McGowan. Kathy is my assistant in the textile collection room and she will help you see some of the details on the dress. So we'll begin here with this beautiful blue and gray two-piece dress in a silk satin damask with a, a wheat stalk motif. It is from 1893. The dress has self-covered buttons and a handmade tatted lace sleeve and Bertha collar. The matching skirt has a double pleat at the left and right of the center front. And because this textile is so outstanding, this style actually remains simple. The donor and wearer are unknown to us, but the Petersham reveals that the dress was purchased at or constructed by Peter Robinson's on Oxford Street in London, which was established in 1833 as a drapery store and later expanded and became a department store until the 1970s. The next dress is a wedding gown worn by Lydia Fay. It is from 1886. It's a blue silk file two-piece dress. The bodice has handmade buttons at the center front and sleeve edges. The bodice back is fitted and has three tails ending in matching silk chenille balls. The matching skirt is pleated at the front with drapery that wraps around the middle of the skirt ending with a fringed trim bow on the left and ruching on the right. The left bottom of the skirt has two large fringe trimmed bows, and the bottom of the skirt has decorative pleating, also known as a furbelow, with a good deal of back bustled fabric. Okay. The next dress we'll see is from 1875. This is a reception dress worn by Emma Louise Ames Loader, the mother of Captain Ames Loader. 
It is a three-piece dress constructed of green silk file with blue silk velvet. The bodice is slimmed down over the hips with velvet inserts and matching covered buttons and is trimmed with handmade braided leaf designs in the front and back. The matching underskirt is made of satin weave silk and is ruched at the front and has a furbelo on the outside bottom. The matching silk and velvet overskirt has, has silk chenille fringe and ball trimmings known as frippery or in French as passementerie. The next garment is from 1898 to 1900. Here we are moving towards the end of the Gilded Age. This is an evening gown worn by Ellen Phelps Richardson. It was given by her daughter, Olivia Richardson White. It is from 1898 to 1900. The maker here is Corbet Wenzel from Paris. This two-piece gown is constructed of blue silk velvet with elaborate jet beading and beaded fringe trim. The sleeves are silk netting with beaded trim. And there are remnants of degraded silk netting around the neckline. And the back has lace enclosures. The matching skirt is embellished with jet beading in an early Art Deco design. Under the skirt bottom is gathered lace. The next garment is a black silk velvet evening cape. It is from 1895. It was worn by Martha Louisa Knox, the mother of Maud Dickinson Snow, who wore the cream wedding dress you saw at the beginning. The silk velvet cape has jet beadwork and tassels across the front and back of the bodice, as well as under the stand-up collar. The cape is lined with changeable pink silk taffeta. And there are small pockets inside the lining to hold a watch or hanky or smelling salts. So the next garment is a three-piece ensemble. This is from 1885. It was given by the Hyde family. The maker was Miss E. Welsh from Hartford, Connecticut. The first uh, piece in this ensemble is the bodice maroon silk file with a plush trim at the center front, cut crystal buttons, and a banded collar, also trimmed with glass beading. This bodice would have been worn in the daytime. The matching skirt has a plush panel on the left side and a panel of metallic braid on the right, and it is draped and pleated at the center front. The third piece in this ensemble is a matching jacket with an open neckline, plush trim on the cuffs, and ornate metallic braid trim at the center front. The next garment in this collection is from 1891. It is a green silk file dress made by Miss E. Welsh in Hartford, Connecticut. It was very possibly given by the Hyde family again. The dress has asymmetrical glass and jet bead trim at the bodice and along the sides of the Lego mutton or Jigo sleeves. Although now degraded, the stand-up collar and sleeve edges did have a narrow lace edge. The matching skirt has asymmetrical beaded panel at the front with large box pleating in the back. The next dress is an 1886 green silk taffeta dress. The maker was Miss O. J. Derby from Arlington, Mass. Unfortunately, the donor and wearer are both unknown to us. The bodice has pleated trim with fringed edges at the neck, center front, and sleeves and it is embellished with steel cut buttons. The matching skirt has draping ending in a knotted bow and asymmetrical ver vertical pleating and plating on both sides and a beautifully trimmed back. The next garment in the exhibition is from 1887. It is a brown silk file with velvet, and it was worn by Olivia Richardson White. The maker was Glover Company, Columbus Avenue in Boston. The decorative embellishments on the bodice of this dress are composed of wooden glass beads and crocheted covered buttons. 
truly fitting the classification of fripperies or hosmentary. It has a banded velvet collar. You'll notice the buttons have been moved at the waistline. We do not know why that has happened. The matching skirt has a center front velvet panel and it ends in points over the flounced velvet. The skirt is fully pleated in the back with a bouffant. Unfortunately, this dress experienced some color loss after being exposed to ultraviolet light by being left in front of a window. But we have repaired this and stabilized it by adding some silk crepeling. Okay, the four dresses in this area <clears throat> have been grouped together to demonstrate historicism in dress during the Gilded Age. We'll begin with the blue velvet. This is an 1887 blue silk velvet plush dress, and it was worn by Harriet Irving Goddard Sprague. The garment represents a throwback to historicism during the Gilded Age because of its red coat bodice, popular during the late 18th, 17th, 18th century. The bodice is known as a ready coat because it incorporates the bodice and train in one continuous piece instead of attaching a separate train at the waistline in the back of the skirt. It's also unique in that it has an undervest of gold floral brocade with matching covered buttons. The skirt has inserts of matching gold brocade at the center front and lower edges of the skirt. It is worn with a bustle cage and there is a fur below inside the train and the skirt front. The next dress in this group is from 1890 to 92. It is a machine made black patterned net over a black silk file with a wired stand up collar, reminiscent of the Elizabethan era. The maker here is C.E. Lee of Boylston Street in Boston and it was given by Lou Van Hyde. The dress is decorated with black jet and steel beading, has narrow weight lace at the neckline and sleeve edges, and steel beads at the waist. There's also a drape around the waist and a bow at the back. The matching skirt has wide and narrow ruffling over a silk file underskirt with wide flounce at the hem and a lace fur below inside. The next dress is from 1899. This is a brown and blue silk brocade with black silk chiffon ruffle trim. The dress is an example of re the Renaissance revival as evidenced by the slit sleeves. Think the time of Henry VIII. The maker here is Madame Bessier of Paris. We do not know the name of the donor or the wearer. The cream colored brocade insert is embellished with polychrome bead embroidery on black silk net. The matching skirt has a gathered ruffle hem. And this brocade is also considered a changeable silk. This garment would not have been worn with a bustle cage, but rather with a small pad at the back of the waist as we transition away from the shelf bustle period to a slimmed down modern version that, um, that was popular during the early 1900s. The last dress in this area is from 1875 to 1880. It is a blue silk satin Basque style with the, uh, the bodice has machine made black lace on the front and back of the yoke. There is no maker's label. We do know that the dress was, made, was worn by Alice Claflin. This dress is an example of the Polonaise revival during the Gilded Age, although its bodice is an example of the longer slimmed down version of styles during the mid 1870s known as the cuirass style. The Polonaise style is indicated by the draped areas at the bottom of the bodice. The matching skirt has a double layer of furbelows, draping, ruching, lace edging, and three flower beaded trinks. We now transition away from historicism and show, we'd like to show you this um, red and gold wool and satin dress. It is from 1886. 
and it belonged to the Georgiana Gardner Thayer family. The maker here is Richard Matthews of Boston. The wool bodice has a pleated silk satin insert with lace trim at the collar and the cuffs. The skirt is draped and has a front panel embroidered in silk plush in a fan feathered like design. The back has the typical shelf bustle common in the later 1880s. The skirt is trimmed with silk satin oversized bows and the bottom has furbelows and underneath is a pleated cotton furbelow. The next garment in the exhibition is from 1885 to 90. It is a brown wool broadcloth dolman with black soutache trim and bullion fringe at the bottom. It was given by Lilla Tower and worn by either her mother, Mary Percival Brigham, or by her mother-in-law, Charlotte Bates Tower. It has a banded collar with trim on the front, back, and sleeve edges. And there is a ball and fringe tassel at the front, which uh, was degraded and has been partially removed. And the dolman is unlined. The next garments in this exhibition are two, we have two three-piece ensembles. And the first is from 1888 to 1890. It is a light brown wool with decorative black braiding on the banded collar, center front, sleeve and bodice edges. The matching skirt has braided trim at the side and hem and is draped in the front and heavily pleated on the back. And this is a time when bustle cages were just about gone and a small pad um, under full volume pleating in the back was common. The skirt is lined with silk taffeta and has a furbelow and double ruffles inside. On the back dress form is the matching jacket, which has a banded collar, sleeves and shoulders with matching trim and vertical bands of trim in the front and the back. It is also lined with silk taffeta. Second of the three piece ensembles is from 1889, and it is constructed of maroon wool and silk velvet. The maker is Miss C.E. Lee of Boylston Street in Boston. The bodice has a, a velvet banded collar, sleeves, and braided buttons, as well as a peplum in the, embellished with black braid trim. The matching skirt has a velvet panel with braiding, as well as braided areas in the front and back at the bottom, and it is trimmed with velvet. The matching dolman on the adjacent dress form is trimmed with braiding and lined with brown silk satin. And you'll note that at the bottom of the front of the dolman, it has weights in it, which prevent it, the wind from taking it up as it's worn over the velvet with the bodice sleeves. With the, the, bo <laughs> the bodice with the velvet sleeves. Okay. The next garment is from 1885 to 90. It is a green and velvet silk metalassé coat. The maker and the donor are un unknown to us. The coat has a green velvet front panel and is embellished with raised, braided, embroidered flowers and vertical strips. The back is split to reveal a green velvet panel that is split to accommodate a bustle cage. The coat has hook and eye closures and a changeable silk satin lining. So we move now to an 1880 dolman. It is black wool with heavy machine cream colored embroidery. The maker is unknown, but it was given to us by the Cushing Salva family. The dolman is trimmed with black silk tassels and black and cream colored silk macrame and chenille tassels. It has a pagoda style sleeve and a silk plush maroon lining.
The next is an 1885 to 90 brown silk file mantelet, heavily embellished with floral designed bronze beading. This has a banded collar and beaded net sides ending in pointed edges. These two garments would have been worn over an evening gown, which would have been sleeveless. Next is an 1880 brown silk file mantelet with a ruffled front, vertical beading, and hook and eye front closures. The maker here is a Morange from Paris, and the donor is Lilla Tower. There is also a belt inside this one to hold it in place, and it again is evening wear. The next is from 1890 to 95. This is a black file capelet with black beading, a lace ruffle, and large covered bow at the banded collar. The maker is unknown, but we know it was worn by Margaret Harris. The last item in the exhibition is this 1895 black satin capelet with a silk chiffon neck ruffle and jet bead trim. The maker is L.P. Hollander and Company from Boston and New York. And that is the end of our exhibition. I hope you have enjoyed seeing everything and we hope that you'll come and see it in person and perhaps even join one of our private tours for even more details. Thank you.